If you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. This is week 2 of our study through the book of Romans. And if you are relatively new with us, what we do is we open up the Bible, we go through books uh, section by section, and we're not against uh, topical sermons, you know, sermon series on love or fear or finances or whatever. We're not against looking at those things from the Bible, but, you know, when you do that, again, not judging anybody, there is the, the tendency or at least the ability to kind of pull the Scripture out of context, and we want to make sure that everything we see, every text we look at is actually viewed in the proper context. So we're going through Romans. This is going to take probably about a year. Uh, this is the second week, so if you are new, this is a good time uh, to join us. We're, in, the, in the late 30s, not the 1930s, but the, the zero 30s, the first century, there was a man named Saul, and uh, he hated Christians, hated Jesus. In fact, he was all about persecuting. There was, a, there was a, what was considered to be kind of a sect that was growing, the small religious sect called the Way. And Saul at the time hated followers of the Way. In fact, he was so passionate in his hatred toward them that he made it his goal to kind of snuff out Christianity if he could do so. He caused Christians to be arrested. He presided over the killing of Christians. And then uh, he was met by the risen Lord Jesus in a blinding light on a dusty road. And Jesus uh, brought him to repentance and faith. And after that, uh, God would change his name to Paul. Paul would be a missionary, a church planter, and one of the most prominent and effective church planters the world has ever seen. Well, he took a number of missionary trips, missionary journeys, at least three. Some of those would last for months. Others would last for uh, as long as a few years. And during those missionary trips, what he would do is he would, he would go and he would, he would share Jesus with people, share the gospel with people, and, and hope that God would bring people to saving faith. And when God did, he would plant churches. So those churches were planted. Uh, well, toward the end of his third missionary journey, he was in a place called Corinth, which is in Greece. And during the winter months, he wrote a letter to the church uh, at Rome. So this is what we know as the book of Romans. Wrote this letter. You're probably wondering, what in the world is this guy doing taking all these pictures? Um, <laughs> well, that's Corey, and he's, uh, we're updating our website. So uh, don't worry. Uh, I was distract, as distracted as you were. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, Corey, for doing that. Um, so where were we? Yes, so there was this guy named Paul, and, uh, and nobody ever took his picture, but he was sort of going around, planting churches, and toward the end of his third missionary journey, he's in this city called Corinth, which is in Greece, and he's heard about these Christians in Rome. And he's heard all these good things, but he's never met the Christians at Rome. He wants to see them, but he's not been to see them yet, so he writes them a letter. This is the letter, the book that we know as the book of Romans. So let's uh, continue our way through it. Romans chapter 1 this morning will be in verses 8 through 17, but let's start by reading verses 8 through 10. The word of the Lord reads this way. Paul says, first, which is interesting here, there is no second, but he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So it's fascinating that you can kind of tell how Paul feels about a particular church by the greeting that he uses. Uh, if Paul's really pleased with the church, he's thankful for them, he's heard great things, he will typically be begin by saying something like, I'm thankful for all of you, I thank my God for all of you. Uh, if he's not so happy with the church, uh, if he's got some sort of beef with the church, you might say he just skips all that, thanking all for God for all of them, and he gets right to the point, uh, kind of like he does with the letter to the church at Galatia, where he says to them, there's no giving thanks for all, there's just a very sort of biting opening, which says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly turning from the gospel. Uh, but here to the church at Rome, Paul says he's thankful for them all. So if he was an Alabamian, he would say, I'm thankful for all y'all, everybody who's there. He's thankful for them. He makes that point. But notice that he's thankful for them, but he's thankful to God. He's thankful for them, but to God. 
Paul says, I thank my God for your faith. Now what he's getting at is he's, he's preparing us, the reader, for what he will say in chapter 3, in chapter 5, in chapter 9, um, in what some have called the greatest commentary ever written on any book of the Bible, not just Romans, but any book, John Murray's commentary, commentary on Romans. Murray writes, Undoubtedly, the apostle gave thanks to God for this faith and recognized the faith they possessed as a grace of God. So while Paul is thrilled to hear the reports of their faith, he knows that they're not the ones to be thanked. God is the one to be thanked. He knows that God is the one to be glorified and honored and praised because God actually gave them the faith that they now possess. The faith that's being talked about all over the world. Here's our first point this morning. Faith in Jesus is not something we conjure up on our own, but is an undeserved gift of a sovereign and gracious God. As Paul will say in Romans 3, there's no one who would ever believe. There's no one who would ever choose God. There's no one who who would ever trust in God's uh, Redeemer that he sent, God's Son. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God's Romans 3.11. Left to ourselves, no one would ever believe. In fact, in Romans 9, Paul will say, so then it does not depend on, the, on man who wills or man who runs, but on God who has mercy. There is a hopelessness and a helplessness apart from the miraculous work of God that cannot be remedied by, cannot be rectified by our own efforts or our own abilities. God draws a sinner to Jesus and then gives him or her the ability to believe. Without that divinely generated faith, no one would ever believe in Jesus as Savior. Now, they might believe that Jesus existed. They might concede that there was a real person named Jesus, but no one would ever repent and believe and sort of order their lives around Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, To another church in Greece, uh, this is a church at Philippi, that Paul also celebrated and thanked God for. He would write to them in Philippians 1, to you it has been granted for Christ's sake to believe in him. Even your belief, Paul says, has been granted to you. The apostle Peter wrote to Christians scattered all over the world and addressed these fellow believers as 2 Peter 1, those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. So why does that matter? I mean, how does that help us? Well, it necessarily gives us two things that we desperately need, humility and confidence. Humility and confidence. Now, you might be thinking, well, aren't those opposites? I mean, how how do we have those things together? Well, they can be opposites. It depends on how they're used in the context. You ever heard of the the humble brag? See this a lot in, in the sports world, you know, the humble brag. That's not what I'm talking about. Humble brag is kind of a, an annoying way to boast without overtly sounding like a jerk. Um, like when someone says, I'm just blown away by how young people think I look. It's really disturbing. You ever heard this? Like, really, you're disturbed by the fact that people think you look so young. So would you be comforted if they thought you looked really, really old? That's, you know, that's a humble brag. Or someone actually said this to me a few months ago over lunch. My parents gave us a beach condo. It's part of our inheritance. You're so lucky you don't own one. It's such a hassle. (laughs) I really, I thought, I I just feel so blessed right now that I don't own a place on the beach. Well, I'm just, oh, I feel so badly for you. Um, Or like this one I saw someone post recently. Still scratching my head that I got accepted to Stanford. Their acceptance rates are so low. Really, you're scratching your head or do you want everybody to know how smart you are? So when I say that the realization that faith is a gift leads to humility and confidence, those two are not mutually exclusive. It all depends on what our confidence is in. Of course, it all starts with humility. If we're ever inclined to look at someone else and think, why don't they get it? You know, why don't they believe? Why don't they just believe in Jesus? Why don't they just trust in Christ? Why are they so blinded? Forever inclined to think that, we're, we're quickly reminded that the only reason we get it is because it was given to us. There's no way we can boast about it. There's no room for looking down at anyone else. 
We have nothing except what we have received. So recognizing that faith is a gift brings humility. It also leads to confidence. Since faith is a gift given to us by God, we can be sure that we'll never lose it. God doesn't give someone new life. He doesn't make someone alive spiritually and then take that back from them. That's not the way God works. And the beautiful Chapter 8, which we'll get to in a few months, Paul will say, there's nothing that can separate us from God's love, not things above, not things below, not things outside, not things within. I'm paraphrasing here. Not even ourselves. God keeps those who belong to him. So if you're trusting in Jesus this morning, if you've come to the end of yourself, you know you're a sinner, you know you can't save yourself, you know that Jesus came and he lived for you and he died for you, he died for your sins on the cross, You don't ever have to worry about God rejecting you. You don't ever have to worry about God abandoning you. You don't ever have to worry about losing your faith. As the beautiful song that we sing around here goes, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I can never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He will hold me fast. Take heart, church family, if you believed on Jesus, it's because God has brought you to himself and he will never, ever let you fall away. He will never leave you. Your salvation is secure in him. Now look at verses 11 through 15. Paul says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now this passage, this section actually goes against our sort of natural way of thinking, at least it does mine. When you think of somebody that you really, really want to be around, you want to, you want to spend time with to encourage them and strengthen them, who do you think of? I'm not asking for specific names, but what type of, you want to think of somebody who's struggling, right? You think of somebody who maybe is having doubts or maybe uh, they're, they're really in a bad way, they're wrestling with fear or anxiety or, or maybe they're in the grip of false teaching or, or maybe they're, they're just struggling emotionally or spiritually. Um, maybe they're lonely, maybe they're depressed, maybe they're caught in some kind of sin. That's the kind of person we think, I really want to be around that person so I can encourage and strengthen that person. These are the folks that I feel most burdened for. I'm sure they're the ones in my mind that I think most desperately need prayer. But right after Paul praises these Christians at Rome and says their faith is being proclaimed all over the world... He says, in essence, I'm desperate to see you so we can be mutually encouraged, verse 12, by each other's faith. When Paul says in verse 11 that he longs to see them so that he might impart some spiritual gift to them, he's not saying that he's the one who, who doles out spiritual gifts. You know, kind of like a first century Oprah, you know, she does with those who, you get a gift and you get a gift and you get it. No, that's not what he's saying. In fact, the, we don't often get into the Greek words here, we It's not a habit, but sometimes it's actually very important and necessary. The New Testament was written in Greek. um, And here the Greek word, uh, metado, actually means to share. This is why the new revised uh, translation translates it share, which I think is a better rendering. In other words, Paul wants to be with other believers so that together they can share. In other words, utilize their spiritual gifts for the benefit of one another. And remember, this is one of the most famous churches in the first century world. This is a church that people know about. This is a church that, that people, where people are talking about their faith. Christians scattered all over the world have found encouragement in the fact that in the greatest city in the world, Rome, where there are hundreds of false gods, there's a vibrant community of Christ followers where they've not bowed down to the false gods, nor have they embraced the morals of their culture. But even with all the, quote, success that this church has experienced, they still need each other. They still need the encouragement and the strengthening that comes from the Spirit 
when they spend time with one another. Here's our second point. Even those who are, quote, famously faithful need to be strengthened and encouraged by the sharing of spiritual gifts. Now, what that means more specifically is that we need each other if we're going to thrive spiritually. You have spiritual gifts that I don't have. And I may have spiritual gifts that you don't have. And you have spiritual gifts that your neighbor doesn't have. And your neighbor has spiritual gifts that you don't have. And what happens is when God's people come together and they humbly use their gifts imparted by the Spirit for the strengthening of one another, it results in the building up of our faith. It, involves, it results in us the increase of our joy in God himself, our confidence in the gospel. We need each other. There's no, what Paul's saying is there's no level of Christian maturity, there's no level of Christian prominence that we get to where we no longer need one another. It's easy to forget sometimes that God works most often through means. In other words, if God's going to pour out his grace on someone, he doesn't sort of bop them over the head with a mug full of grace. He uses means. And and most of the time, it's other people. God pours out his grace in us through other people. Uh, Theologians would say that he does so not immediately, but immediately, you know, not just sort of like, like a lightning bolt, but, but through other people. When we share our gifts with one another, whether it's the gift of mercy, which some of you have, and I've been the recipient of, and I'm thankful for, the gift of encouragement, the gift of wisdom, the gift of discernment, the gift of leadership, service, faith, teaching, you know, that's just a few. We are then instruments of God's redemption. Peter says that we are stewards of God's various grace. So we are the channels by which God pours out His grace. We are the instruments that God will use to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, to help others along their journey. Last Sunday, when Janine and I left the worship service, we were, we were just floating. Um, some folks had said some things to me that were just perfectly timed and perfectly worded and just exactly what my soul needed. And I, you know, I, I don't know, I didn't know the Spirit was going to prompt them to do this. Some folks had shared with me they were willing to serve in a way that was desperately needed, which was a huge blessing to me. Um, and that same morning, one of the girls that Janine teaches in her class handed her a written note that Janine said was one of the most precious notes that she'd ever received. And so we were, you know, we were just, we were floating. And, and it's because of the encouragement, the gifts that God has given his people that they very kindly poured out in our direction. You know, as important as corporate worship is, and I love corp- corporate worship, and we had a whole series on why it's so important. As important as corporate worship is, that's not the only reason we gather together as Christians. In fact, someone could, someone could actually argue and make the case, I think it can be made biblically, that that's not even primarily, that's not the primary reason we, we gather as Christians. Some people say, you know, when I come to church, I just want to focus on God and I want to put away every distraction and I want to kind of ignore everybody around me and not be distracted by them. But as pious as that sounds, that's actually not biblical at all. One of the main reasons we gather together as believers is to do the one another of Scripture. Encourage one another. Courage, uh, carry one another's burdens. Love one another. It's this Greek word, alelon. One another. Pray for one another. Serve one another. Accept one another. We could go on and on and on. A theologian John Frame writes very pointedly, in worship, we should not be so preoccupied with God that we ignore one another. You say, wait a second, that sounds sacrilegious to me. Well, don't we see in the Bible over and over again examples of God's people gathered for worship where they actually incite the ire of God because they are ignoring the people around them? If you don't believe me, read Amos chapters 4 and 5 where God says to those who are worshiping him, away with your worship. Stop worshiping me because you have ignored the poor and the marginalized and the disenfranchised around you. So what I'm saying here, and what Paul's saying when he says that he wants to be mutually encouraged by the most, you know, we could say 
the most uh, well-known church in, in the first century at that time is we need each other. We need the gifts of one another in order for us to be strengthened and thrive spiritually. So let me just say, just as a very, very practical note, with summer fast approaching, um, don't allow this to be a time where you, you slip away for three months. I mean, yeah, of course, take the vacations, enjoy the beach, celebrate the getaways. You know, those are all great. Those are all wonderful. And I've got vacations planned this summer too. But let your pattern be, your pattern be, on the Lord's day, you're gathered with God's people. Let it be the, the exception, not the rule. The exception that you're gone. Other people need you. I need you. We need each other's gifts. And you need the gifts of others. And God promises to meet us in a special way when we gather together. And, and, and as a side note, people ask me questions all the time about parenting. I'm not the parenting expert. I'm not the guru on parenting. But people just ask me. And one of the most important things you can do for your children is to show them that the church, God's gathered people, is of tremendous priority to you. Because if you show them by your actions that the church is not really that important to you, as soon as they have their own freedom, they won't treasure the church either. All right, so Paul says he desperately wants to come to Rome, but he's been prevented so far from doing so. He says he's under obligation to both Greeks and barbarians, to the wise and the foolish, which just means that his ministry obliterates and destroys social classes. We talked last week about the city of Rome, and I gave you some of the characteristics of first century Rome, and one of those is that, you know, that social status was a very big deal. Well, in a culture where social status was virtually everything, Paul says his ministry is non-discriminatory. He will preach to the educated and the uneducated, the so-called wise and the foolish, the rejected and the despised, everyone, because the gospel must be offered, presented to everyone. And he says in verse 16, he's eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Now, this, of course, is Christians, famous Christians, we could even say. Why would Paul want to preach the gospel to them? Now, look at verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So these two, these two verses really form the thesis of the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 1.16 is probably the best known uh, verse in Romans. Um, in one of the best known in the whole Bible. It's, you'll find it on mugs. You'll find it uh, on t-shirts. You'll find it on fridge magnets. You'll find it even tattooed on some people's arms. I'm not going to say who, but it could be somebody in very close proximity to me. Uh, this is a verse that, that's well known. It's a verse that's, that's deeply loved. Uh, and it's an awesome verse. But it can only be properly understood in its context. For the longest time, I thought I'm not ashamed of the gospel was a reference to being bold among non-Christians. Not being ashamed when the gospel is brought up in public or not, not to looking away or, or ignoring it when the gospel is brought up at school. I thought this meant you know, that I was going to be I'm supposed to be bold when non-Christians, when the secular world talks about the gospel. And certainly that's absolutely true. We are to be bold. We are to be unashamed when the gospel is brought up. But notice the first word of verse 16. For, Paul says, it's a conjunction specifically for you grammarians. It's an explanatory conjunction. If I started a sentence like that in my 11th grade writing class, Mrs. Shanks would have circled that first word, handed it back to me, and said, rewrite it. You don't begin a sentence with the word because. That's what it really is. The word because. But Paul never had Miss Shanks. <laughs> he don't care. I use poor grammar there in honor of Mrs. Shanks, who would regularly correct me. Paul actually doubles down on that approach. So listen, this is fascinating. Look at this. Verse, verse 17 begins the same way. Four. So does verse 18. Four. So does verse 19. Four. Verse 20. Four. Verse 21. Four. 
It's kind of like that scene in uh, The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is leading the whole gang to see the wizard. She says, we're off to see the wizard because, 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 right? Paul says, because, 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 because. So there's a long string that Paul's pulling on here. Now, again, it's certainly true that we should not be ashamed when the gospel is brought up around unbelievers. That's absolutely true. And Paul will say, even in chapter 15, he wants to preach the gospel to those who've never heard. But why would Paul say, begin verse 16 with, because? The word because follows what Paul says in verse 15, namely, he's eager to preach the gospel to you Christians at Rome. So Paul says something like this, I'm not ashamed of preaching the gospel to those who've already heard it, who may not realize how badly they still need it, and to those who've already received it, and... He'll go on to say to those who've never heard it. So he says, I'm not ashamed of going, on, uh, going uh, over again the very fundamentals of the Christian faith, the foundation of the Christian faith with those who've already heard those same fundamentals maybe even a thousand times. This is a reminder to us that Christians need the gospel as we saw last week. It's the medicine that God uses to heal, comfort, and change his own people. But it's also a caution. We should never assume that the people under our spiritual care, the people around us, our friends, that they really understand that salvation is by faith alone. We should never assume that. That our own children know this. That our friends know this. Never assume that someone says, I'm a Christian is actually believing on Jesus alone for salvation. Paul says, I'm not ashamed to tell you Christians the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, here's the thing about salvation. The whole idea of salvation presupposes danger, doesn't it? In other words, why would we need to be saved? If, you, if, if when God did a miraculous work in your heart and brought you to repentance and trusting in Christ, if you called somebody and said, hey, I got saved last night, well, they're going to want to know reasonably, saved from what? Like, I didn't know you were in danger. I didn't know you were in peril. If you were not in peril, if we're not in peril, why would we need to be saved? Paul will go on in chapters 2 and 3 and explain in great detail what we're saved from, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, uh, enslavement to sin, the curse of the law, all of those things. But here he sets the stage by saying the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, salvation from God's wrath, salvation to glory, and, and and for whom? Everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Doesn't say everyone who does enough. Doesn't say for everyone who earns it doesn't say for everyone who comes from a certain lineage or family line or educational background, but for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, it's inclusive in that sense, regardless of ethnicity, race, background, social status, moral history, or any other human distinctive, God's offer of salvation is indiscriminate. Now, not everybody receives the offer. Only those who believe enjoy God's salvation. Not just that there is a God, not just that Jesus was real, but that Jesus is the Savior who died for my sins, was raised again on the third day, and that I am a fallen, broken, self-centered person who needs to be forgiven and delivered from myself. And I'm trusting in Jesus' perfect obedience for me and his death in in my place for my forgiveness. Now, look again at verse 17. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. In other words, it is a righteousness that comes from God and is bestowed upon the one who believes. Now, by the way, it was this particular verse, Romans 1.17, that absolutely destroyed Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer. It was 1505, and Martin Luther was just 21, and uh, he became a monk. Uh, 
And what he says, all my life, all I wanted to do was just please God. And he was so convicted that so much of his life was actually not pleasing to God that he thought if he could just become a monk and just put away every sort of distraction, every temptation, every visual temptation, whatever it was, then maybe God would overlook all of his sin. And he was, by all accounts, a very good monk. We might actually say he was an overachieving monk. If monks had a valedictorian, Luther would have been it. He prayed fervently, denied himself, confessed his sins, fasted. He would actually later write himself, I was a pious monk. And so strictly did I observe the rules of my order that I may say, if ever a monk got to heaven through monkery, so too would have I. And yet, despite all the religious activity, despite all the self-sacrifice, Luther continued to wrestle with a guilty conscience. He feared God. He feared death. He was terrified of, of hell. He feared judgment. And these fears tormented him. He couldn't sleep. At times he couldn't eat. because so overwhelmed with fear. Now what brought about these fears specifically was the phrase, the righteousness of God. Because Luther thought, and he'd actually been taught by some of his teachers, that if he were to get to heaven, he would have to attain to the righteousness of God. And then Luther came across Romans 1.17. And he, he was absolutely wrecked by it. Here's what he wrote. I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly. I was angry with God. And yet finally, by the mercy of God, as I meditated day and night on Romans 1.17, I paid attention to the context of the words, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Then I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. This then is the meaning the righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel. That is the pa passive righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. And whereas before the righteousness of God filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. Here's what all that means. This is our third, our final point. God declares unrighteous people to be completely righteous by giving them upon faith a righteousness they did not earn. And I have to tell you, I, I, I wordsmith that sentence a dozen times, but that's as clearly as I could, could say it. God declares unrighteous people to be completely righteous by giving them upon faith a righteousness they did not earn. I know it's a lot, and I know it may sound confusing, but I think the rest of Romans, especially when we get into chapter 5, it's so good. It's going to help us to make sense of all of this. So let me close by illustrating it this way. This is an illustration I've heard. Maybe you've heard it before. I've heard several preachers, including J.D. Greer, who's Southern Baptist, use this. But, and it's not a perfect example, but I do think it's a good example. I think it helps. Um, imagine you're in school... And you've got one final exam at the end of your school career that will determine everything, whether you pass or fail, whether you make it or don't. And when you get the final exam, you look, you look at it and you realize, like, I've got nothing. I don't understand any of this stuff. I can't do anything with this. You realize I can't produce anything. And so you just put your name at the top and you proceed to the front where you're going to hand in your blank paper. Well, suddenly, shockingly, another student grabs your exam, crosses off your name and put his name, puts his name in, the, in place, and then writes your name instead of his name on his exam. You pass, you get 100%. He takes the blame for your failure. He gets severely punished, doesn't make it, in a manner of speaking, you pass with a perfect score. 
You are not being rewarded for anything you know, anything you've done, anything you've accomplished. But for the accomplishment of another. This is what Jesus did. He took the exam of my life and wrote his name on it and took his perfect life and gave me credit for it. Now, he will be exalted for his obedience, for his death, resurrection. But what I receive from Jesus is the gift of righteousness. Nothing I've earned, nothing I could ever do. If you're in Christ this morning, your final has already been handed in. Your final's already been submitted. You've already received a perfect score. You got a 100%. God looks at you as though you got 100% on everything. Now, it doesn't, of course, mean that you can live however you want. It doesn't mean that you don't still strive for holiness. But now you live with a gratitude and a freedom and a joy and with a desire to honor the one who took your place. You're forgiven. You're free. You are accepted. Now you live by faith, believing that Christ has done everything for you. And because of that, now is everything to you and for you. Let's pray.